All right, hello world, this is CS50 on Twitch. My name is Colton Ogden, and today I'm joined by CS50's Connor Doyle. Connor, thank you for coming onto the stream. Thank you. What are we, uh, what are we talking about today? Yeah, so uh, welcome everyone. i um, excited to be here on my first time on the stream. Um, and today we're gonna be looking at augmented reality development, specifically in Spark AR, which is a tool released by Facebook um, to develop uh, augmented reality applications on Android and iOS devices. Um, on Messenger and Instagram, so. Nice, I'm pretty excited. The augmented reality is definitely trending. You and I were just talking about this right yeah. before the stream. It's been around for a few years, but I think, you know, given hardware limitations probably wasn't, you know, in its initial phase probably wasn't as popular as it's surely going to be soon. Um, tools like Spark AR, which you're gonna talk about today, are, you know, sort of what we need to be able to progress in that sense. Yeah, I think right now, or even augmented reality is like a really uh, nebulous term. There's mixed reality, there's virtual reality, there's augmented reality, there's XR. All these different kind of like vocabulary for describing this kind of movement into the virtual realm where we're going to be experiencing sort of the physical world in this kind of digital way. And that kind of hybridism between the digital and the sort of physical is kind of what AR is exploring, I think. And Snapchat obviously have been a big proponent and they've released a similar software to Spark IR and there are a lot of different Unity, a lot of has loads of AR applications, not just for a mobile device, but also like HoloLens, um, Magic Leap, different things like that. So there's definitely a lot of uh, excitement about AR right now and its application, or MR and its application in the world. But I think you're right. I think like simple tools like Spark AR, which will allow you to, simple in, simple in the terms it's really easy to get into. They're quite sophisticated, but simple to sort of get grips with. Um, allow you to sort of explore the kind of storytelling and sort of uh, possibilities of this media uh, for future interaction because I think that's what it's going to be. I think right now, like, everyone's looking at these devices going, oh, it's really hard, AR's really difficult, but we've got to try and envision a way in which it's going to become very seamless with our interaction with the world and, like, one way is to begin to visualise how we're going to interact, like, in UI design. I know people use Spark AR for, like, UI, different things like that, like... One way to start to explore or play with those possibilities is using a tool like this. So. Right. Yeah, we're only as powerful as the tools that we have. Yeah, uh, exactly. And you've sort of been at the forefront of, you know, ever since the VR phase sort of hit us <laughs> back in, I think it was 2015 Correct, yeah. Um, you've sort of been kind of passionate about this sort of new progression that we're taking in the, in the world of tech. Yeah. Um, and this is sort of how you came on to CS50. Would you mind talking maybe a little bit about how you got introduced to CS50 and <laughs> your history with us so far? Sure, yeah. So... Um, so back when I was a freshman, I'm, I'm currently a student at Harvard College. I'm uh, studying English literature, I'm a senior. Um, and back when I was uh, a freshman, I was really interested in like storytelling, specifically looking at kind of like theatre and how theatre could scale um, to different places around the world or how we could give a sense of like um, theatre um, in different environments and theatre like not in, a, not in an actual traditional setting. So that led me into um, virtual reality, actually. I went along to an event in Boston um, that Kaleidoscope held uh, with Rene, and um, it's kind of like a, a film festival, but for virtual reality experiences. And I tried on a headset and was immediately like, whoa, blown away. And was like, this is definitely gonna be the future of like how we experience the world, how we relate to it. There's something, there's a seed in it that's kind of special. So. That began my journey into VR, and then I, I was um, looking at sort of coding things at, on campus, and I came across CS50, and I reached out to David, and we began talking about sort of some of the video aspects of, of what's been happening at CS50, obviously, incredible video production team. Um, <laughs> shout out Dan Coffee! CS50 Woo! production, And yeah. Ian, and CS50 production, and everyone. Um, but I was like, yo, yeah, what about VR? What about virtual reality in education? What about virtual reality in CS50? And, that's when the conversation started, and we did a lot of really cool projects and developments. So we did CS50 around the world, which was um, we sent sort of VR cameras, small VR cameras, to uh, different people around the world who take CS50 online, and we got to see their world and environment. And we filmed sort of 22 lectures in virtual reality as well, right. um, that went alongside the actual traditional capture. 
so that people could put on a headset and be at Harvard and see David and see the lectures. So, and that's really where my um, sort of journey with CF50 started and has been developing ever since. It's a very novel project, and I think we may have been the first university to film their lectures we were. in VR. Yeah, we yeah. were. Yeah. Pretty amazing, pretty amazing accomplishment. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. I think that VR and AR have a lot of potential, um, and especially once they've proliferated, I think, because right now it's not common, I think, that you see people with the, with the actual hardware. Yeah. Um, but you know, more, much like computers themselves back in the 80s, 90s, as soon as we actually proliferate this hardware, we make this a commercialized thing yeah. to the extent that computers are, smartphones mm. are. Um, I think you're right. I think we have a lot of crazy, awesome stuff uh, sort of in the near future. Um, and this, today what we're talking about, Spark Air, is kind of a step in that direction. I'm going to actually um, switch over to your screen here if sure. we're all set here. Um, and also, why don't we pluck off a question we had. Uh, also, Cyril says, great <laughs> accent. Shout out to Connor for being our first UK representative <laughs> on stream. Big up! <laughs> um, but uh, Andre asked, uh, XR, what does that stand for? Yeah, so XR, that's a great question. XR is the kind of... So because we've got augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, mixed reality, kind of XR is kind of sort of this, the space between like, okay, we don't really know what the reality is yet. It's like all the, it's like all of them combined. It's sort of like all this kind of X nebulous stuff, reality. It's like um, an umbrella term. It's an umbrella term, correct. Um, Peaky Blinders is also quite funny. That's a, that's a great reference. I am from Birmingham. That's a good, uh, that's a good, uh, good accent pick up there yeah so but no to what you were saying i think that um in terms for xr at least because of the definitional difficulties with this technology i mean like um it's moving so fast and different hardware providers are trying to scramble to try and create these kind of lightweight glasses which enable sort of this kind of mixed reality experience or is it augmented reality or is it holograms or is it projections this is really kind of difficult to kind of discern actually what this stuff is because in the popular language you know people might say a hologram is a thing that is actually projected into space that's materialized in space and that's like what some definitions prescribe it as that and then other people other you know hardware manufacturers will say that actually if it's projecting into the retina then maybe it's just that is a hologram as well and if it appears to be in space then it's a hologram so we get into difficulties. <laughs> a lot of different interpretations, a lot of different versions of this, a lot of different deployments of this idea of accentuating the real world with things that are not physically there. Correct. But have a visual sort of representation. Sure. Or not just visual. I mean, augmented reality can, can be basically anything that's adding to the reality. So it can be sort of haptic, it can be auditory, it can be sort of um, taste, smell, all that sort of stuff. And there's really cool developments actually happening in like unique scents that are being, you know, generated um, in, in AR and like weird stuff like that. That's so. funny. I remember back in like the 90s, I think there was a like smell of vision yeah. or the 80s. This was a thing that people tried out. Obviously, the technology back then was a lot worse probably than it is now. So I'm curious. <laughs> I would be very curious because I think that would really take people in different directions, especially with games. Yeah. Can you imagine going into like... The first thing that popped into my mind, I've just been playing Resident Evil 2, like there's a sewer level. Can you imagine going into a sewer level? Be grim. <laughs> Be grim. Absolutely disgusting. I think of like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory where you can like reach yeah. in and like take the chocolate bar uh, out of the screen. It's and then like actually smell it. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I don't know how feasible, I mean, um, olfactory and sort of taste are related. So I'm curious like how that would evolve into like taste feedback. Yeah. If there's even a possibility. Yeah, and look, taste is linked to smell quite a lot as well. Yeah. So there's kind of these interesting questions. And these are all going to be potential realms. I mean, it kind of seems far off right now. Like, oh, yeah. what I'm going to be taste, I'm going to be like smelling stuff in games. <laughs> but people are exploring it. And, you know, maybe it's kind of, it's kind of coming. We yeah. don't know yet. <laughs> Andre asked an interesting question. Yeah. Virtual reality has problems with causing motion sickness. How does that work with AR? That's a great question. So... One of the reasons virtual reality causes motion sickness or has been like said to cause motion sickness was that because basically wearing a VR headset, it occludes, it stops you from seeing the world at all. So that if your body's moving and you're not moving in AR, I mean in virtual reality, sorry. If you're, so if you're walking around but the, the headset's not tracking properly, then you have this weird out of body experience where like the track kind of throws you and you kind of feel nauseous. Um, Whereas AR, because AR is um, projecting onto the world, so it's taking the sort of given sort of visual plane as a sort of uh, base level. 
and then just adding certain things on top of it, then you're not gonna get the same kind of total out of body experience because you always have a reference point in the world. So even if the track doesn't track properly, it's just gonna be like jumping around and not gonna be like actually throwing your kind of whole body around in the same way VR does. So that's one way in which uh, motion sickness is not as much of a problem in augmented reality. Would you mind coming over here just a yeah, little sure. bit? I think you're getting cut off there. I apologize for that. Um, all right, awesome. So AR will make millionaires. So on that note, um, so Spark AR. So this is what you have yeah. loaded up. Where can folks, if folks want to get Spark AR, first of all, is it free? Yeah. And where can people download it if it is? Yeah, so um, Facebook released this completely for free. Um, and you can download it right now. And I can get up, get it up um, at sparkar.com. Um, just download, I think it's about 250 megabytes or something. Um, and you sign in with Facebook and essentially it allows you to deploy um, these, um, whatever you develop in the development environment directly to um, Facebook um, and you can share it with your friends on Facebook. And there's a closed Instagram beta as well now as well that you can apply for. So you can also release filters directly to Instagram. And one of the coolest things I think about this and one of the reasons why I really enjoy using this tool and um, advising others on using this tool is that the seamless quality of it for user experience. So say you build this incredible augmented reality application in, in Unity or Unreal, and you're like, hey, I really want to show you this app. Uh, I really want to show you this like, experience. Download this app. And like, that's been one of the biggest problems, like the friction barrier there, like having people having to like go on, download the app, just to experience like, like a simple filter or something. Like, they're not going to do it, essentially. Right. Um, Works well for games, I'm guessing, but not sure. for something that someone's going to spend 10 seconds looking exactly, at. Exactly, right? Yeah. They'll delete the app instantly. So why Spark AI is interesting, because it's literally just a link to, if you have Messenger installed, which quite a few people do, or Instagram, then it just loads the camera in that, in that service and just allows you to use the Spark AI sort of creations directly in the device with the app already loaded. So that's one of the best things about it, I think. Is there, uh, is there the ability to make standalone apps with Spark AR Studio as well, or is it intended strictly for... for it's intended strictly for Facebook, gotcha. yeah. Gotcha, okay. Yeah. Um, you deploy directly to Instagram or Facebook Messenger. That makes sense. I mean, uh, plenty of people use it, so it doesn't really matter too much. Yeah. yeah. In that sense. Cool. All right. Well, uh, I'm excited to learn a little bit about it, because I don't know almost anything about this. Great. So. Okay, so should we dive in? Yeah, let's dive in. Let's dive in. And All right. if folks have any questions while we're doing this, definitely post them in the chat. We'll take a look. Yeah, smelling games is a terrible idea. I'll bet it'll be killed by pull my finger jokes in Fortnite. F pull my finger jokers in Fortnite, says Andre. Maybe. <laughs> I wouldn't like that, actually. <laughs> um, be kind of grim. Yeah, a little bit. Um, so let's, yeah, let's load this up. Let's fire this puppy up. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to quickly explain like what we're looking at here before, before I start building anything and take, talking about the features. So... <laughs> This video always makes me laugh. So it's this is a stock video. It's a stock video. Um, and you'll see why the head's tilting and stuff in a minute. But So what we're going to be focusing on is there's um, Spark AR basically allows you to use both the front and rear facing camera um, in, um, on, on a phone. And basically how it does that is um, we use a messenger app. But for the front facing camera, i.e. the one that's facing a face like the one that's being shown in this sort of portal view window right now, is there's different things that it, it sort of has built in. It has like a face tracker to like perfectly sort of track the face in 3D space. It has a hand tracker. And then for the reverse camera, so for the rear-facing camera that faces sort of into the world, if you're going to sort of take a picture of something, it has a plane tracker. So a plane is basically any kind of surface um, and what, why that, that's important is because if you were to place an object um, into the world, um, or at least make it appear to be in the world, then there needs to be a sort of stable tracking surface that the phone can sort of know the position of in order to accurately place that digital asset into the physical environment. So that's what um, rear-facing camera does. Front-facing camera um, is what we're going to be looking at primarily today. Um, and specifically, we're going to be looking at some of the face tracking and face mesh tools that are built directly into um, Spark AR. 
Cool, cool. Somebody actually asked a pretty entertaining question. Kind of suspected the Brit accent, um, thanks to the series slash movies, but I can't distinguish between Scottish Brit accent. Do you have any tips for distinguishing between a Scottish and a British accent? Um, <laughs> I thought I'd get some accent questions. Can you on do? Here. Can you do a Scottish accent? I, I can't do a Scottish oh, accent. Okay. I don't want to sort of. I wonder if it's a stereotype, maybe that UK people all can do each other's accents. Yeah, we can't. We can't. It's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> the, no, the Scottish accent is like. Um, it's definitely distinctive. It's very, it's kind of distinctive. We have loads of different dialects in England that that, that vary on region. Um, Even like Birmingham versus like Newcastle, which is that's Luke, major. No, that's a major one. Because no, like, Luke was Luke was yeah. from Newcastle. Yeah, uh, yeah. So there's loads of different accents. I, I don't know. Maybe watch Braveheart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, okay, so um, great. So right. So we have. Different couple of panels here. Let me just talk you through. So we have the inspector panel on the right-hand side, which has um, any item that you've cl you, you click on, it sort of brings up the sort of um, features that you can change or different parameters on the right-hand side. You know what I should do? I should probably get rid of our chat. Oh, yeah, get rid of the chat. Because That's it's going to be a little, it. a little bit hard to see. Yeah. Um, I'll just get rid of it altogether. There we go. Okay, we'll hide that for a sec. Yeah, so on the right-hand side here, you have this kind of inspector, which has all the sort of values that you can change depending on what you're clicking on in your scene. Over here in the scene panel, you have the device. Then you have the camera of the device. And here you've got the front and back camera that you can select. We're currently selecting on the front camera. And we also have the microphone as well. Um, so you could do like sonic, uh, can, like you could do things based on audio. Yeah, as well, yeah. There, you can play sounds, but you can also distort sounds coming in as well. So, so you, you can, can make like a robot yell voice. and make something happen. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that, that's feasible. Um, so in the camera, um, I said, so if we look in this scene right here, this is kind of a, a 3D sort of... It's like uh, Unity almost. It's, like, it's almost like, it's, that looks a lot like Unity, but yeah. it's very much like Unity in terms of this, and there's loads of different views as well. So you've got like, that was perspective, but you've got orthographic, you've Great. got bird's eye, that's like right sort of front. These are all different views of the 3D scene. That's cool, yeah. Yeah. Very much like a Blender or Unity interface. Correct, yeah. We're currently from the front, so. Give me a second. How did we just? <laughs> okay, we'll stick it here for now so we can see it. So. Here we've got the face, and this is us looking directly down the camera. So the first thing I'm going to do is going to show you the face tracker in the scene. So if we insert here, if we click this plus button up here, is that is that cut off in the... Oh, no, this just happens to be because okay, our, our window has moved over. Okay, perfect. It looks like that. So if we insert a face tracker, it looks like nothing happened um, because we don't have a mesh to render that face tracker. But right now, uh, the face tracker is the sort of thing that is tracking the face in the scene. But in order to represent that track, you might want to insert sort of face mesh. So by hitting face mesh, whoa, mm -hmm. now we can see um, how accurately it's tracking the face in the scene. And some um, people are asking, um, yeah. you know, why is the woman in the, in the shot making all those facial expressions? Yeah. Um, but presumably to test, I'm assuming to test different things, right? Yeah, so the reason why that there's kind of this weird looping video looking left and right smiling is because you got if we now look at that mesh, we can see how well the face mesh is actually performing on and tracking on the face. You can especially see it when she opens her mouth, when she does like the shocked look. Yeah, and also if we look up here on the inspector panel, we have different things um, for this mesh. So we can actually disable the eyes um, oh, on the face mesh, and we okay. can also disable the mouth as well. Um, so that's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit strange. Um, Why might someone want to do something like that? So say if we, so say, for example, like we want to create a mask on the face, which I'm going to show you in a minute by applying some sort of material to this face mesh. If we want the eyes to be visible in the material, or if we wanted the mouth to be visible or invisible, this oh, is just a very easy way to do that. Okay, yeah. got it. Makes sense. Yeah. So this is pretty simple, this is just a face tracker, but it's kind of sophisticated that it's built straight in. And another thing I want to point off right off the bat is that um, this person's doing all these like, weird, funny faces, but if I go to video up here, um, I can change the person doing the video. Uh, there's different couple ones that Facebook have sort of give you here. Um, or we can actually hit the face on HD camera and point it at me. Nice, <laughs> surprise, we have a green screen behind us. Take it out. And oh, here I am. Um, nice. And you can see it tracks pretty, it tracks 
really well. And this is all just happening in real time. This, this is, is all real this time. This is a pre-recorded video. This is you actively right now making, yeah. It's, it's me making weird it. faces. Yeah. <laughs> um, Andre is asking, what would be the primary device for using an AR app, um, Oculus or a mobile phone, tablet? Yeah, so again, just to reiterate that Spark AR is, um, <laughs> <laughs> Spark AR is built for uh, Facebook applications. So it's built by Facebook. It's meant to be deployed on Facebook services. So right now it's deployed on Messenger and Instagram in closed beta. Um, so that's what um, this kind of application is built for. So particularly mobile, but it can be on iOS and Android. Sure. Got yeah, it. it works really well. Um, People are saying it works great. Yeah. It does. It, it articulates really well. Um, if we go into assets, so now we've got a face mesh and we've got, if I put my hand, you can see it kind of distorts a bit, kind of needs to detect the face. Um, we've got this face mesh going on. If I want to apply a material to the mesh instead of this kind of canvas, if I go to assets and I hit create new material, and then I, on this, under the face mesh, there's a material box here. If I click add and I hit my default material, now I've got a material on my face. So I've got this kind of very simple, very plain white. <laughs> sort of default um, material. And I can disable my eyes, which is kind of really weird, as I was saying. Right, yeah, so this would be, yeah, I guess if you had a texture or model that you didn't want to see your eyes through, yeah, it would make complete sense. Or I can disable my mouth, which I just did as well. Or you can just disable the whole thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> we get the real deal. So, I'm gonna keep the eyes for now and the mouth. <laughs> and then there's loads of different, why this is so cool is that you have this kind of assets and, and the, the device tracker is that under the material shader, under the material, sorry, there was loads of different like things you can apply to the material, there's loads of different shading options. So uh, under diffuse, you can apply sort of different color, different colors to the, to the mask, pretty simply by just like positioning it in different ways. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, you can then, I'm just gonna get it off that. Should I go back to white? <laughs> People are saying it looks like the robot guy. I'm assuming they're talking about Mr. Robot. Oh, oh, maybe in like iRobot. There's a well, there's a show called Mr. Robot. Oh, I oh yeah, I, yeah, you're right. iRobot. Yeah, robot, robot. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that's what I they robot. are talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's really cool stuff like specular, um, which can introduce the kind of shininess to the mask um, in different ways. And then if I were to like, this is why it's so good. You end up just playing with this sort of stuff. I have to take down the opacity a bit you start getting these kind of really kind of interesting, weird effects on the mask. Right now there's like a hard, I immediately want to solve this. Right now there's like a hard line on this mask at the top. Oh, right, yeah. Um, and say I wanted to get rid of that hard line. You want to make it look like it's more a part of your actual face? Yeah, like it blends it a bit more. There's right. different couple of ways you could do that, but one way actually would be to enable this thing called alpha down here. And under the, under the texture um, part of the alpha, um, Spark AR give you face reference assets up here in a folder. I just love watching the mask, like actually pretty well lip sync to what you're saying. Yeah, it's no, a good it's, tool. it's real time. If I go into texture and if I choose uh, now under the reference face assets, which I just pointed out is under the help section of Spark AR. And then if we go into face uh, mesh mask, and if I um, open that, um, you can see now that this is kind of blend right, shape at okay. the top of the mask. The color is a little bit, so right here you would maybe want to change the color of it too to match your skin tone, I'm guessing? Yeah, oh, I was going to actually show something even more interesting in a, in a minute that okay. you can apply. This is just, again, this is just the default material. You, there's also, you can apply image textures here. You can okay. apply external textures, which are kind of interesting. So you can pull textures from a URL. Um, oh, that's cool. That's hosted online that okay. can be changing. That or cool. you can also, host videos um, as external textures, and you could actually video, put a mask, um, put a video directly onto this mask. Um, M. Shamanali was asking, what webcam are you using? This is just a front-facing webcam on my Mac. Yeah, just a MacBook, is, MacBook webcam. It's a MacBook webcam. Nafiz was asking, can we have a different voice? I'm guessing um, in the software, but that would be kind of hard to, I think, show on camera. Yeah, I don't think we can show this on camera, but yeah, you can. I think you can definitely distort the voice in, um, in the app. Okay. I think there are ways of doing that, if I remember correctly. Yeah, we don't have an audio set up for his computer currently at the moment, but. Great, so we've got this weird mask going on. Let's kind of, let's get a bit more into the features of this tool set now and, and think about, you mentioned like not having my face, 
let's kind of explore deeper into like potentially getting my face onto my face in this kind of weird way. Oh right. Okay. So if I if I get rid of this material for a second, and we're back to our, our favorite it's face like mesh. Under, abstract mesh. Exactly. Under face tracker, they actually have this really cool tool called texture extraction. Uh, and if you hit texture extraction, it creates a material down here called face tracker, the number of the face tracker, which is we're currently face tracker zero, face tracker zero texture. So if I go and create a new material now, um, and under the material, under texture, I apply the face tracker zero texture I just made. And then if I go to, this is just for the material now, and we'll call this material face, I'll call it my face. If I go into face tracker and into face mesh, which is the sort of canvas that you see it's highlighted in the, the window now. Um, and under material, if I add my face, bang. <laughs> Here so is my face. It's a texture um, being generated of your face that's getting applied to... Back to my face in, in real time and mapped to the mesh. And you can kind of see this a bit better if I were like to insert maybe... Um, like uh, say a rectangle or something real quick. And if I were to like, say if I were to bring, if I go into the face tracker and I bring the face mesh maybe off my face slightly, like forward. Oh, right, yeah, okay. Um, I don't even need a rectangle, I can just do that. You can kind of, oh, where did that go? There it is. You can kind of see how that's like, how that's kind of crazy. So it's following your face motion and it's applying this transformation to the 3D object that now has... <laughs> you got to see my face. <laughs> now has a texture map of your face onto it. Yeah, and like right now it's a bit dark. So if I were to, under the ambient lighting here, if I were to like um, uh, apply another ambient light into the scene, you can see it gets a bit lighter now. It's kind of a bit more matched. And then maybe I want to like... Maybe I want to bring down, maybe the my face material uh, is a bit too um, visible right now. Maybe I want to change the opacity of the material a bit. Oh, interesting. To create this cool, okay. like, um, parallax thing. So you can see already, like, just by playing with this, there's some really interesting things you can do. If we bring the opacity back up here, like, we go into the face track, we go into the face mesh. We can see we've got no eyes and mouth, but now if I enable the eyes, you can see here my eyes back on the, on the texture. And, Here's my, and there's my mouth gone, and there's my eyes gone. So if you put that back onto your face, now I noticed that there was like a sort of a difference in skin tone between the texture. I mean, I'm assuming yeah. that might be a lighting function. That is a lighting function, yeah, and you can, if I have a drink. <laughs> uh, it screws up, it doesn't, it doesn't recognize it anymore. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay. Yeah, but already you can do pretty cool stuff, and like what I, a, a, simple tool, a simple thing that I really like started to do um, from this was like, okay, so um, if we just pause the tracking for a minute, We've got one um, face mesh, right? But there's no reason that only needs to be one. What if we were to duplicate the face tracker and the face mesh and like maybe offset that in a different in a different plane? So if we right now actually this is kind of annoying. Is there a, like a like a right click to rotate the scene or something? Yeah, there should be. Um, hmm. I don't know why that isn't. Hmm. There we go. All right, if I go back to perspective here now, okay. So if I, if I click on the face mesh, you can see that one is here and the other one is right next to it. But if I were to move this back now, and if we hit play. So thanks to Arca Derazial for the follow, appreciate it. Great. Now you can see we've got two, two, um, <laughs> two faces doing it. Nice. Uh, this back one doesn't have my face on it. But I can pretty easily um, under face mesh. So just zero. you just duplicated the mesh that was already there and moved it, moved it farther away. I just duplicated space. the mesh, and now I've got two okay. like mini me's <laughs> that operating, as you can see, relative in relative position to my face. So you could have like a scene with like five pe different people, but put the same face on all of them. That's one potential thing you could do. Correct. Right. Um, this is kind of looking pretty crazy though right now. Um, have we got alpha on this? No. So. Maybe if I just put, um, if I go back to face mesh mask, now I've got this kind of interesting alpha blur. Remember the thing we did earlier on the blur? Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. To create that line. To make so it a little more seamless. Before, you see this is hard line. Right. And um, 
if I redo that. Now we're, we're blending again. So it's kind of really fun. And like, um, this is kind of like, kind of quite an advanced, I'd say, feature of it. But um, to track faces, it's something that I really like because I think that how it's pull is because it's not pulling. One thing you think it would do, what you think it's doing, so it's kind of really hypnotic seeing me do this. <laughs> Maybe I should just like pull this to say. One thing you think it's doing is you think it's just pulling the, the, the camera data and applying it directly onto the face. And I tried doing that and, um, because you can also pull the, the actual camera feed and put it into objects in the scene. And it's not doing that because if you think about it, if it takes a flat, if you take a flat sort of thing of a face and put it onto a, a mask of a face, it's gonna distort and not be mapped correctly to the face. So it's actually working out the geometry. It's using the 3D data as a kind of reverse engineer. You, have, a, you have an image of what the face looks yeah. like when it's unwrapped. Right? And I can show you, so under reference face assets here and under textures, you can see that like, this is weird, <laughs> but you can see like this is what a texture might be that you would apply to the face for this face track. Right. This is what it essentially has to generate and then wrap around. This is what it's generating and what it's wrapping back onto your face from a standard feed, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so here's a... Slightly more muscular version. Muscular, sort of <laughs> face, masculine, it says here, face. And then if we go into this, you can see the sort of geo of right. the, of the okay. face mesh. And then um, that was the face mesh mask, which creates a kind of... Uh, yeah, exactly. It's like a UV unwrap, yeah. yeah. Um, and then here's the, the track and points on it. So if I say I wanted to create like a really cool like face paint, or like there's lots of different people have done these effects where they've got like face paints or things that like animate around the face and stuff, they'll use kind of something like this as a reference asset and they'll bring it into Photoshop and they'll sort of distort it or, or, or you know, graphic image manipulator program or whatever. Right. Um, and they'll distort it in whatever way they want. And then when it wraps onto the face, it will wrap correctly onto the face. Andre is asking, um, at the top left, is that the light source for the shading back in the in the studio? This, yeah, this is the directional light. So, so when you move that around, you'll see changes in what the how the model yeah, so itself let's, is let's illuminated. Like, let's just get rid of, let's just actually just go back to, to, to base on this and we'll just reapply a face tracker and a face mesh real quick. Yeah, because I also want to see it with uh, the blending too and see how convincing we can make it look. So, hold on, so if I just bring this back on, <laughs> I think I need to reset it to zero. Here you go. So this is on my face. What, what were you saying we should do? Um, well, a couple things that I would like to see. First off, uh, use the blend thing that you talked about now while it's on your face. Like, first of all, get the image back onto it. Is it my face back onto yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. So that, that would be going to my material and my face. Right. And then I don't think that's, uh, is that? No, that's not good. Hmm. It's tracking correctly here. It's kind of interesting. One second. I was going to say, if that was actually the mesh, that would oh, be Oh, that's why. It's because if you hit material, my face, and then never go to my face, and I hit um, face tracker zero texture. It's kind of interesting. One moment. I think it's because I deleted too many of these. Um, I kind of just randomly deleted stuff. So I think <laughs> if I re if I recreate it, so just to quickly go back, go back over this at speed, face tracker, face mesh, go into face tracker, texture extract, that face tracker texture here. Create a new material, call it whatever you want. We'll call it like my face or something for now. Go into the my face under texture, click face tracker zero texture. Then under face mesh, material, my face. There it is. Nice. <laughs> we're back. Took a while. There we go. So now we have um, you know what we were at before. Now what if we applied the blend operation to that um, to that? What mesh? the alpha thing? Yeah. Yeah. No, we did. Yeah, we did do that earlier. But we'll do it again. Alpha. Um, under choose file, we go to face mesh mask. And there, that's the that's with the alpha. Nice, thing. yeah. See, there it's starting to look more convincing. It actually matches the skin tone pretty well. Yeah, it's a bit dark. And one of the things you can do, this isn't the only way you can do this, but you can start if you've got your own face. Um, um, and if I take down the opacity, there a we bit, go. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, if I take down the opacity, you can see there's a bit of flailing here. But you can start doing cool stuff. Like there are other ways to do this, but you can start when if I add specular now. Um, 
and I really, if I, um, you can see that it's not applying to a shape, it's applying to the actual skin tone on right. my face. Okay, you just went to a festival or something. There we go. <laughs> moist, <laughs> really weird. Moist color. People love this kind of look. Uh, do, you mind, do you mind if I test it on mine as well? Can yeah, I see go ahead. Like? Let's see what you look like. Let's see. Uh, will it work? Yeah, it will. Oh, wow, look at that. Look, I just put on some makeup or something. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's pretty crazy how that works. So yeah, without, and, then it, and then it screws it up. Without. Oh, wait. Mm. Hey, hold on. Hold on. Uh, oh, it was, maybe I got used to yours or something. <laughs> um. Um, and then obviously you can, what, what's cool is that you can start applying like um, colors and stuff. <laughs> like, because it's got the face now and it's got the geo of it, if you change, this look, I look so ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a it's like blue man suit, <laughs> blue man group. I mean, uh, um, also David popped in the chat saying thanks for tuning in to see Connor, 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 and Colton in reference to your three faces. Oh, my three faces. That's funny. <laughs> Connor, 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 and Colton. So this is kind of weird, but you kind of get the gist. You start playing with this tool, and you start going. There's so many options here to to to, to do things. Um, this is tracking on my face. It doesn't even look like it's tracking on my face, but you can see here in this panel that he's doing a pretty pretty good job at doing it. Um, another thing is that right under Face Tracker right now, right, we have a face mesh, but that um, is not the only object that can be sort of tra tracked to a face. If I wanted to sort of like, and if I import an asset right now, like there's a project I did, um, I really like the design of Virgil Abloh actually, um, and as a sort of a uh, funny thing, I thought it would be great if I sort of took the famous speech marks of Virgil Abloh and tracked that to my face. So what I created was um, in Photoshop was um, a 3D, um, I extruded some text and created a 3D object. You can also download 3D objects online. Um, Those are just quotation marks? These are just things? quotation marks, right, uh, with some space in the middle. And then in Spark AR, this was kind of the first thing I did actually was um, to test it, was I just dropped these in. Um, and if I get rid of the, oh, yeah, if I get rid of the face mesh now and just have these, you can kind of see that these are kind of tracked to my head. Oh, okay. In this kind of funny sort of way. So, you, so if you start thinking through the, the possibilities of what this means, it's like you can you can recreate like artistic, you can recreate any sort of um, artistic sort of uh, portrait or anything using the face. Not You don't have to like just use the face as a face. You can use the face as a sort of reference point for other objects in the right. scene. Yeah, you're just at this point, you're just taking 3D objects and manipulating their position orientation. Yeah, and you're manipulating the position orientation relative to the space. There's another feature that I want to get into before we go deeper into the face track, although we've done quite a lot in the face track now is uh, background segmentation. So another big, another big, um, and I'll take, I'll, another big feature of, <laughs> this is a funny thing, other people use it actually. Another big feature of Spark AR, one of the, um, and we haven't even scratched the surface really, and this is meant to be a sort of introduction to Spark AR, not uh, by any means an in-depth um, exploration. And there are tutorials and resources online are really, really good. So I definitely check them out if you're interested in any aspects of this at sparkar.com. Um, but here, right, so say we want to do a background segmentation. What does that mean? So right now we're actually being green screened, as we saw earlier. Surprise. Surprise, yeah. we're being keyed um, on a green screen, and that means that the, the camera's looking for green pixels, and then it's taking those green pixels out of the image and replacing them with whatever background we want. In this case, my laptop screen. Um, well, you can now do that without a green screen anywhere in the world using, like, uh, using your front-facing camera and Spark AR does and other tools do this and I'm going to show you now how we can do this on Spark AR specifically. So in Spark AR under camera, uh, which is um, sort of the top left, the camera that, that's sort of built into the scene, um, we have text, uh, we have segmentation here. Now if we hit plus and we hit person under segmentation, we created down here on the textures, we've created a segmentation mask texture. So if I go into the camera and I insert um, like a background, so like a rectangle, say, and then I make that the size of the screen by hitting fill parent, we now have this sort of canvas as the background. Um, but the problem is, 
what, how does it know what to cut around? Um, because right now it's just overlaid directly in front of the camera. We want to create, we want to kind of cut around the person. And one way to do that is using the segmentation mask texture that the camera generates automatically for you in the scene. And the way to do that is to, under the rectangle, we need to add a material. So we're going to create a material. Um, and we're going to call it um, segmentation, segmentation um, background. Under segmentation background, if we then and we're going to go alpha, um, we click alpha, and we go segmentation mask texture, and then we hit invert, and then we go back to the, that was just setting on the material itself, and then we need to apply the material to the rectangle. We hit rectangle, and we select the material, and we seek segmentation background. Here, you can now see, uh, not too clearly yet, but if I apply a color, you'll be able to see it. Um, that the background can be anything we want now, um, and it's being segmented. That's and awesome. We so we have some sort of algorithm, I'm guessing, that like can detect which, you know, what part is the person in front, what part's the background. Yes, and it does a it does a pretty good job. Like if you see that, that's keying me. Yeah, it's not bad. No, not at um, all. Pretty well, and you know, if we change this, just to prove the point here, like this isn't the color of the wall. This is like the color that we're selecting on the color wheel. How well does it deal with like background objects? Like if I had, if I stood does pretty, you, I mean, it does pretty well. If I stood behind you, would it still you work? You stand behind me. Uh, yeah. Oh, so it actually, okay, so it takes people. Uh, it takes people, okay. yeah. Oh, I disappeared You there disappeared for there for a sec. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, and like, as you can see, it's kind of, if you look closely, it's fraying at my hairs. Hairs are always difficult to keep. Right, yeah, because um, the color kind of seeps through them a little bit. Yeah, yeah. but if we go into segmentation, uh, if we go into the segmentation mask texture and we go here, we can see that we can increase the mask side um, uh, or we can, de we can contract it as well. And we can also smooth it out here, make it less smooth uh, or make it softer. And this means that obviously right now there's a blue background, but if I wanted to put anything um, behind it, I could. If I go into the segmentation background and if I select texture, and hit new image texture. Again, this can be an external texture. It could be a video um, that is hosted online, or it could be an image that's hosted online. Online, or we can go into downloads. And I had a picture of the CS50 there. This isn't going to wrap correctly, so it just it doesn't wrap properly. But you can sort of see. <laughs> right. If you were to stretch. This... If I were to stretch this out um, properly and map it to it, it would it would make it appear as if I was at the CS50 fair. Um, and you said you could do this with videos too. So and you, you can could... do a video, so we te I mean, yeah, you can do a video as well. So we could host a CS50 fair every day if yeah. you wanted to. Right. Um, so if I just, I'll just remove that for a second. There we go. So you can see that there's this interesting, this is an interesting, uh, another tool that can be used to, to do really cool stuff in, directly in Spark AR. Um, this introduced me to something I actually wanted to talk about, which is, um, like a powerful part of Spark AR, which is the patch editor. And we're not going to get too much into the patch editor today, um, but I want to talk through some of the things that it that it has sort of built in for free. So if I hit view and if I hit patch editor, you can see there's this kind of blank space that opens up at the bottom of the screen. If I right click on that space, I get all these kind of interesting options um, on the left hand side. Um, and basically, what the patch editor allows you to do is create triggers and create different actions that can be applied to any parameter, pretty much, that you saw in the inspector. Um, so that means, um, say, if we look down here, it has loads of different, um, what they call kind of like nodes uh, that you can manipulate. So face landmarks. So I've got cheek, chin, eyeball, eyebrow, interaction. Uh, we've got like a blink here. We've got eyebrows lowered, eyebrows raised, head nod, head rotation. Say if we big head nod for a second. So it creates this kind of like node here. It takes in a face and it outputs a sort of tr an impulse. Is has the head been nodded? Um, so we need to input the face actually into this head nod tool. And the way to do that is by typing in face uh, and hit the first sort of thing is face finder which um, finds all the phases in the current camera frame. 
So we want to find a face, and right now there's a one count, if we sort of see that, there's one face in the scene. Um, and if I hit face select, I want to select that face <laughs> um, of index zero and put that face into the head nod. So this is kind of like a visual programming environment. This is a visual programming environment, yeah. And this is kind of like what CS50 teaches with Scratch and also what some other services like Unreal and Unity with their third-party plugin sort of offer. Yeah, but why I like this is it's so easy. Um, and it, the, the difficulty becomes if you start doing more complex stuff, actually this, the node visual base isn't the best. Um, but you can actually write in JavaScript and bridge it directly into oh, Pack cool. Editor as well. So, like, actually import JavaScript and turn that into a, into the this uh, into into this kind of patch editor. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Into into custom kind of nodes, and people right. have done that. There's some really good people in the Spark L community that have created sort of really cool different solutions to problems like 3D collisions, stuff like that. It'd be cool to maybe showcase a few interesting um, AR projects too. Maybe yeah. to, maybe towards the end. Yeah, we can definitely check out the Spark AR page too. Some people have some, had some questions up above. Sure. Um, um, Andre was asking if there was no need for a stereoscopic camera because the face orientation was yeah, figured out from question. shadows. Yeah, so I actually, I'm not quite sure how uh, the tracking works. I had some debate about this, but it does not require a stereo at all. Um, it, it uses just a single camera. Like right now, this webcam isn't two cameras, it's just that. There's no depth sensor, right. anything. I think it, I actually don't know how that works. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> Shadow, shadows would make sense, but that would kind of, um, well, no, that would make sense, because I was conflating the light that it actually provides in the software versus the light that it's getting from the environment. Um, somebody earlier asked a question about whether it's possible to import ambient light. Do you know if it's possible to like take light from the real world and like make that appear in Spark AR? Yeah, well, there are certain like ways to get around that. You can you can sample areas of a scene in in from the camera texture. So I the see. camera has its own texture here under texture extraction. And then you can um, use that texture like in, you can use the alpha or RGB uh, values of that texture um, as a sort of um, reference for something. So yeah, you can take the ambient light from the scene. Okay, that's interesting. In that way, that's how I would do it. I would take the camera texture data and then I would use that to manipulate the parameters of the asset I would like to. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Natasha was saying, loving this live stream, learning a lot from you guys. AR is fantastic. Brilliant. Um, M4 and Ju is saying that this is used to blur backgrounds in the newly released Microsoft Teams video conference. Um, I don't know if this is this Spark AI is used specifically, but definitely probably something similar um, to that. And I know that like Android also on their camera app have like an interesting like background blur feature and stuff like that. This is definitely becoming into sort of the vocabulary of visual. Um, uh, the visual kind of images we're seeing on, like, people upload online and stuff. But right. um, this is where you can manipulate it, actually. You can manipulate the parameters of it and not just have something automatically sort of assert a certain blurriness level of stuff. Like, And this is where you, this is actually sort of a point, actually, that's good to dwell on, actually, for a second. And why I really like AR and is that start thinking beyond just, like, um, a background blur. Like, start, and start thinking about how you can make that dynamic in some way. Um, and maybe this is a good point to bring in an example um, from from the Spark AR from the Spark ARs. Sure. Do you want me to um, cut the? Uh... No, it's good. I can I can just load it up here. Oh, okay, you have an actual project. Yeah. So this is a really cool um, like example of a project that so Spark AR give loads of sort of tutorial um, tutorials um, of like how to use the product. Um, it's they're really cool, um, and there's some really good uh, sort of they go through more advanced stuff um, in the tutorials like. The 3D objects don't just have to be static on the face. They can sort of wobble and rotate, and you can like animate different like splines and stuff in it. Okay. But we're not going to go too much into that today. But one thing I wanted to show you here was this is a really good example of like the node um, of the of the patch editor being used. So we have a scene, um, and in the scene we have a sort of rectangle, um, which has this kind of overlay of like um, of a diffuse texture here. So if we look in the rectangle overlay under the material, we can see there's a frame color map. And if we click on that material, we can see that the texture has this blue sort of patch, it says created next to it. And that means that it's actually a patch in the patch editor here. And you can see it's also blue here. Now, if we look into the patch editor, we'll see that it says screen tap. 
and there's a there's a sort of impulse here, and it's, if it's tap, it's increasing a counter, and the counter number is selecting an option number from these colors. So this means that if we tap the screen and we can simulate touch by pressing that, um, it's going to change the color of the filter of what we're looking through. Um, and this is really cool. But one way I would say immediately that could kind of elevate this potentially or provide a different sort of uh, more sort of interactive or dynamic way of just this kind of standard filter is if we were to um, insert, say, a face tracker here. Um, so if I go into the canvas and I insert a face tracker into the scene. And if I put this onto this, mm, one second, insert, apply this to this. Here we go. So maybe if I make the face mesh invisible for a second. So right now you can see that the same frame is being used, but it's actually now tracked to the face. It's in 3D, yeah. And it gives it this kind of really interesting 3D. And all the patch still works, like I can touch and I can change um, the color. And it's kind of really cool. Um, so if I, I can show you this um, in a bit more of uh, a dynamic way. It's so much more immersive. Yeah. So here, look, now it's me <laughs> wearing this, and I can tap and I can change the color of my face. Um, this is to say that, like... It's just an incredible jump in... How, how crazy is that jump between, like... <laughs> <laughs> between, um, between kind of a static, although this text is dynamic as well, so I guess it's, there, there was some dynamic stuff in it. London represent. Yeah, London, shout out. Um, <laughs> you can tap and sort of immediately change it. And this is, like... For essentially just two clicks, this is a really powerful uh, feature out here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the change in, in sort of how interesting and dynamic that was is it really speaks a lot into, like, small details make a big yeah, difference. Yeah, and, and, like, that wasn't hard to do, and, and that's something I would suggest sort of thinking about when you're developing AR applications. Like, okay, so this is, this is the effect I want, like, a background blur, but how can I tie that to a movement or to something in a scene that can create this kind of, like, dynamic aspect to the filter? So really capitalizing on AR as a platform. Yeah, right? and, like, and Spark AR particularly, like... So there's so many, like if we look down this uh, list here, like there's so many different things you can like blink, eyebrows lowered, eyebrows raised, um, you know, all head shake, head rotation, mouth, object tap, right eye closed, um, surprise face, smile, all of those could trigger a different action in it, you know, or a change to, the, to, to what is occurring on the screen. Um, and some of them can be sort of signified. You could say, you know, bring up a text thing saying smile to activate or like smile. And then maybe if they smile, there could be loads of flashes like a camera or something. Like the creativity can really uh, run wild in Spark AR, And that's one of the, the coolest reasons why I think the app's really successful. Yeah, no, it's tremendous. Like the, just that little small yeah. piece kind of illustrates like how you can take something and really take it to the next level with this. And like if we if we bring out the fa if we drag in the face tracker into the here, like into this into the patch edit, you can see what it's doing. It's like finding a face, it's selecting the face and then it's tracking the face and you can see actually that you've got the 3D position if I if I play this for a second. Um, you've got the 3D position values in X, Y, and Z here. You've got the rotation value and you've got the scale value here. So you can actually take any of those parameters and set them. So if I were like, when I'm this close to the screen or this far away from the screen, I can change some sizing aspect or some color depending on the position in space. So this is kind of where you start thinking about the spatial storytelling behind AR. Like it's very easy to just attach a face tracker like what I've done right now and create this kind of cool color thing. But like what if like the color gradient changed depending on the position? What if like we started introducing like these kind of details like by tr tracking them into space? What if I had to be in a particular rotation or position in order to activate the feature? You start to sort of see how the play of the kind of experience becomes part of creating really good sort of user experiences and fun kind of filters for people. And right now it's like seen as like filters like to share, but you can, if you step this out into the world where we start developing like narratives and stories based on user interaction or like create avatars, 
and creating this kind of digital mirror to yourself. This is like a really powerful going forward. And it's a great way, I think, to like, uh, I'm thinking of ways to tie it into like, uh, I mean, somebody even commented on Thanos, but like bringing this into marketing for movies where there are characters that do things yeah. and you can, um, So you know. we, we can, um, yeah, if you, if one second I can bring up some examples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we, um, so if I, yeah, if I just quickly loads, I can go into the Spark AR um, community, great. Buddha was asking, is this the perspective parallel model? I'm not actually entirely sure what that is. Um, the perspective parallel. That was the perspective view that we were looking at in the view. I think that's what the question was yeah. sort of signaling. Um, oh, talking about parallel projection of, uh, onto a plane. Oh, I see. If I'm interpreting this correctly, I think that would make sense, I guess, yeah. Um, can you remove the Fresnel, says Andre? I forget offhand what Fresnel is, too, actually. It's been, a, oh, it's been a little while, Fresnel and 3D. Oh, I see, the reflection uh, relative to the uh, angle of view on a surface. Can you do that? I don't, because there's a directional light, I'm assuming that that's part of the lighting algorithm. Yeah, you can, you can definitely change, once you've got the tracked element in the scene, you can definitely change the lighting position and that will change the, uh, relatively change the, um, uh, the condition on the face. Like there's an example in the Spark AR tutorials where you've got a flashlight and you're holding it under your face. Oh, you're not holding it, it's, it's under your face. And they create um, a face tracker and the light kind of actually occludes off the mask and creates this kind of interesting look like the flashlight kind of series story look. And that's, I guess, something to do with the, the lighting. We got a Arturo J. Real in the chat asking, how are you bringing up that search? Yeah, that's a great a question. It's a right click in the patch editor. Um, so if you right click in that space, and in order to access the patch editor, if you hit view patch editor, that's how, um, that's how you select it. it. That's how it will appear in the bottom. Also, the shout out to AJ. Big shout out. Thanks for being part of the shout chat to today. Um, Adam, what's up? Hello, Adam. Um, kissing face trigger, does that exist? <laughs> it does, yeah. Does it does, exist? It oh, does. Well. Pretty much there for the duck face selfies, says Andre. Um, can you track hands, as an Andre? Yes, you can. You, def you can definitely wow. track hands. I didn't, okay, that's, that's yeah, cool. It sounds cool, but actually, there's been some cool ones doing it. Like someone did a baseball once, but you like held your hand up and the baseball like animated into your, <laughs> into your hand. So you can kind of see the, the, the potential. Um, there's also something I wanted to mention that we didn't get to, which was um, the texture tracking as well. Um, so in the, we've done a lot of front facing camera, um, but there's a really big potential for in Spark AR, especially for more advertising and marketing sort of minded people for the rear facing camera to um, replace advertisements. Um, and how that works is, so it detects a plane, which is any sort of surface, but any kind of post or image or video is a surface. So if it knows what that image is, it can actually detect, you can say to Spark AR, when you see this image, replace it with this. Um, and it can be at any scale in the world because it's actually just digitally replaced. So you could take right. a massive billboard um, of like, you know, um, any sort of big brand and you can completely replace it with a video or your idea. You can make screens out of flat surfaces. I think it's really cool. Um, People could also potentially replace other advertisements maliciously with this, right? Yeah, and I wanted to mention that Burger King actually just released an ad campaign um, where you can, um, it has loads of their collected, uh, loads of the collected competitors um, like McDonald's and different burgers and different deals. And if you hold your phone, up to their ads, it sets them on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And I it like brings that. out the Whopper and says, you know, uh, Whopper, and you get a free Whopper out of it as well. So. That's funny. But it's funny because that's just like showing how like, it's actually kind of nefarious if you start to think about like our visual worlds, like the world of advertisements around us, is can be like individually tracked and targeted in this interesting way. Like right in that example with the, with the postcard, we saw that we had uh, interactive text on that actually it was a dynamic text so depending on the device it was being used it would show the date the, the current date and the current sort of location but that was tracked directly into the physical world so you can imagine it uh, if you were tracking a sort of texture plane of an advertisement that that if that was pulling from um something that was personal related you know some other data they had they had <laughs> other data that was available um, um you could individually sort of 
target advertisements as well via this. You can see yeah. that not being too far away. Yeah, no, it's yeah, like the hyper reality <laughs> film, exactly. Um, Adrian was saying, uh, how do you think advances in AR, VR, MR, XR will change storytelling? Uh, majorly, majorly. Um, what I think that we're moving. This is a great article that came out on Wired that talks about the digital sort of mirrorverse, uh, where essentially, if you think about, not to get too deep into augmented reality sort of uh, theory or ideas, but if you think about wearing a pair of AR glasses on your face and anything you look at being able to be sort of captured and tracked and created a 3D model of, essentially in real time, like we just saw here, it's creating a 3D model of my face in real time, then Conceivably, if you walked around the world, it could generate a map of where you walked around. Um, and then it could basically create a mirrorverse to the actual real world that's one-to-one, -one, a perfect map of the real world, um, that's constantly updating by the people that are wearing the headsets. Um, that's getting a bit far down the line, but essentially that's to say that imagine like a, an alternative sort of parallel universe that's digitally uh, generated and created that can be manipulated in all the ways that digital gives us access to. We can pause time, we can rewind time. It exists eternally. Um, it starts to get pretty crazy. If you start thinking about the possibilities like that, you could walk through any place that you've ever visited. You could rewalk that path right. and, and appear to be there. Um, you could go to places that you're not currently at by going into a model of that place that's being created in real time from other people. Obviously, that kind of makes obviously sense. far <laughs> down the road because the computational power for that would be pretty insane, but the idea is theoretically definitely achievable. Yeah, no, it is. And that's uh, thank you, AJ, for putting that uh, link there. That's the link to the um, to the mirror world is what I'm kind of thinking about. That's a lot what I've been thinking about recently. But more simply, I mean, um, sort of more proximate uh, change, I guess, in storytelling will be the way we sort of take photos and interact with each other. The visual language of our, of, of our photos online and of how we um, share and how we share experiences will start to be sort of augmented. Um, by like, you know, people like the hot dog filter on Snapchat or things like that. These are like small examples of what potentially could be a big tear in the digital physical divide, um, which is now facilitated by this kind of portal phone, but can be any kind of visual way of uh, altering vision. Right. Cool, cool. All right. Um, let's go ahead and are you ready to switch to your computer? We can take a look at some, uh, um, some samples. Yeah, I just wanted to like hide the chat on my... Yeah, um, take however much time you want to. Yeah, um, I'm just going to quickly figure out how to how to do that. Stevie O.E.V. saying Stanford is better. Ooh, what a burn. Stanford is doing really good stuff right now. When will you live stream about SDL2 library via C++? Um, we don't have any hard set plans on any of that. I would have to take a look at it, I think. Um, I've done SDL with C++ in the past, but it's been a long time. Adam says, what's up, Colton? Not much to doing some AR. We're here with Connor Doyle. Shout out to Connor for his awesome Spark AR sort of uh, overview today. It's been yeah. a really cool platform. I'm actually really excited about yeah. the I, possibilities here. I'm trying to load up um, some of the examples so you can cut to see how like smart. Uh, it's all on Facebook, so you know naturally there's a lot of, obviously we want to make sure we're not sharing private stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I'm trying not to do right now. <laughs> oh, you're such a hacker, man. Look at you. I know. I'm trying to get out of it. Um, it's getting really... Uh, I don't know why that's... And Adam um, is saying, what's up, Connor? What is up, Connor? What's up? Not a lot right now. <laughs> me, me trying to figure out how to remove um, a whole bar from, from this. <laughs> <laughs> And then AJ's saying, Hyper Rally, can you, um, are you able to right click like a, a particular link um, and maybe oh, yeah, in, in, incognito mode or something? Yeah, that would be a good idea. I'll do that. Um. Voila, he's in there. I see you right side are so sleepy. I'm not sleepy. I might just look tired, actually. Yesterday I was not feeling well at all, um, so I slept much of the day yesterday. Feeling better today, but that might be why I look sleepy. Um, I'm just going to pick one that I think uh, there's loads here. Uh, there's yeah, there's an videos. absolute ton of uh, um, demonstration videos. It's crazy because people developed whole, like I said, people have developed whole UIs in this. So like you can you can bring in textures and assets and like animate them onto the world. So people have like, you know, for instructions for how, you know, we've we've looked at kind of like, kind of funny examples I guess today. Um, but like for instructions of how to like, potentially deal with paperwork or like, access certain devices. You can you know you just track the, track the image of like 
you know, how to assemble furniture, for example. And if you hovered over it and then lift it up, it would basically, you could animate the thing building itself and you could just uh, yeah, that would create be cool. it, right? Um, and in AR, you could do it. Like, this could be, I mean, the potential is crazy. Um, let me just, yeah, let me just load up any one of these real quick. Adam was saying, is AR used at all for self-driving cars and testing them with it? In self-driving cars? Um, I'm trying to think. It, there's a different type of tracking in AR cars. Um, so like Google Weibo, for example, uses, um, has this LiDAR sensor on the top of it that's creating a depth map that's then sort of uh, put into sort of these machine learning algorithms to basically, there's different ways of tracking the world around you. Um, Google Waymo is doing a thing with LiDAR, which is kind of like a more advanced version of tracking than this. You could say it's kind of like using the tracking of augmented reality in a similar way, but I wouldn't say it is augmented reality in that sense, um, in the sense that it is overlaying physical assets into the world right. for our visual or, that's or used our more sensory. For, that's experience. used more for like uh, detecting physical things in the real world and adopting an algorithm. Yeah, it's like the right. car, the car, it's not our, it's not our sense that's being changed, it's the car's sense. So it's like a tracking for the car, not a tracking for us. It's kind of, kind of, but that's an interesting question actually to think about, like, what about augmented reality for non, for, for non-sensory, for non-empirical use? It's kind of an interesting question. Um, M4, I'm completely off topic, I'm super frustrated with the limitations of Bootstrap. Do people use other packages like Semantic UI, Ant Design to complement Bootstrap? Uh, probably, I think it's, I mean, it's up to you as a developer, but um, Semantic UI is really cool. I've been diving into it a little bit. I think it's definitely worth checking out. Okay, I think I'm just gonna click on, we'll just load, <laughs> these are all really funny. Um, okay, this one's pretty cool. Oh, that um, one is pretty cool. How do yeah. I open this? So for now. So if you just click on the, if you just click on the actual page itself, uh, or right click and go to like view page or whatever. Yeah, see there, now that your chat's not visible. Okay, so let's do that. You can, you can take a look at that. I'm gonna switch to your laptop and come to Okay, cool, yeah, cool. that's good. All right. So you can see here like an example of that someone's created with this morphing animating, this Christian Venable, shout out Christian, this is great. So awesome. they, have like a, they have like a background, potentially that background's a 3D model as well, but they have minimally some models rotating around their head and also one sort of juxtaposed on their face or inserted onto their face. So you can see here they're using a face tracker to, to track that. Um, a morphing sort of crystal on the face. They're using a screen tap to change the color. Oh, okay, that's um, cool. It looks like, and they're using segmentation. So it's a very flexible format. Do you want to pull maybe another example? I'll, I'll bring up sure. the laptop. Sure, uh, no, yeah, laptop. I'll just, I'll click this one. This looks like a similar one. Andre's saying, wow, that looks really realistic, apart from the guy. <laughs> Are you referring to the guy not looking realistic, or what's up, what was on his face? Would you want AR to have a part in theater, or would you rather keep theater as it is? That's a great, who need, who, that's a great question. Um, I'm really interested in AR in theater. Um, I think it's a big, there's a big space there for spatial storytelling and spatial experience to be kind of infiltrated by this kind of digital tech. And there's been examples like The Tempest, which is a Shakespeare play, and the RSC Sarah Ellis. Um, Oh, it wasn't Terra Ellis. No, it wasn't Terra Ellis. My apologies. The, um, the Tempest was done um, with a collaboration with Intel, and they basically tracked an actor live and then projected into this kind of like um, surface the kind of a digital asset. Um, so it was like a, the actor was on stage performing, but it was being tracked into this kind of magical fairy on stage. So that's like an early stage use of AR. One of the difficulties of AR. Um, in theatre is that like right now the viewing device for AR is like glasses, AR glasses or like a phone um, and the glasses are very expensive and, and kind of are cumbersome currently and the phone in theatre there's always a worry that people are going to be like taking video, texting and they're going to be distracted from the live experience so there's a boundary between like wanting to add digital assets into the space and then also wanting to preserve the integrity of the, of the live experience and that's something that's been always a challenge in like live music, for example, as well, or comedy. And in some comedy events, people actually take away the phones now and give you like a seal the bag and give you this kind of bag that you hold so you can't actually access your phone at the event. That's funny. So there's kind of interesting questions related to that. But yeah, no, um, I personally think that AR is definitely coming into the spatial storytelling realm and there's definitely going to be an interface with theatre. If that's going to replace theatre, I don't think it's a question of ever replacing like VR, is VR going to replace cinema? Is VR going to replace movies? Is AR going to replace 
you know, immersive experience. No, it's just a different platform for viewing immersive experience. I think it's a completely different sort of platform rather than a sort of um, replacement in that sense. A bit more, more closer to installation or closer to like smaller experiences. And there are really cool theatre companies like Punch Drunk, uh, which develop like Sleep No More and things like that. They're exploring these kind of um, immersive um, and digital sort of divide. But that's a great question and something I'm thinking about a lot. I feel like for especially for uh, like theater, like the phone. That's a great point, actually. Sorry, oh, yeah. uh, I think subtitling theater in real time would be awesome. That is a really good point. I think that would be really cool as well. Um, but the question would be though, again, um, and people have done actually done subtitles in AR. The question is like, if I've got my phone out and I'm watching the theater through my phone, when I can be what it, why wouldn't it, why can I just use like a projector screen with the subtitles on? Like, why, what, it, what would be the added value of AR tracking the text into the space unless it was part of the experience? And that's a question, that's another way of thinking about, like, AR and VR. A lot of people will um, have ideas about AR that could be achieved um, more, in more seamless ways uh, by using just video. <laughs> and that's where it becomes kind of difficult to think about. But I would agree. I think subtitling theatre would, in real time would be amazing to track it into AR. Um, but only if it was like integrated into the experience. Otherwise, it's just why wouldn't it just be sort of like a projector screen? Yeah, these are kind of things to think about. That's true. But, yeah, having like a, an animation of it, like going around people, like the quotation thing that you showed earlier. Yeah, like if there was some sort of like if if the play was if the play was or the the event was very interested in words, or if there was some kind of other real time aspect, maybe the text was being like inputted by a certain like if it was tracking like the heart rate of people in the room or it was like maybe or if it was there was some other thing that was inputting into it or play was concerned about text in space then maybe that's something to think about but otherwise it, yeah Jekyll and Hyde with Sherlock like thought bubbles that'd be cool that'd be cool yeah yeah no tracking tracking text onto people in the space would be cool definitely oh yeah like a speech bubble yeah that would be really yeah the text really like cool. appearing on them would be cool but again it would be like you're trading off the fact of me seeing it in stereo to me seeing the the whole experience in this like flat mono video on my phone in a in a smaller frame. So it's a question to think about. Opera also is something I'm actually talking to some opera companies about doing. So yeah, opera would be incredible. But again, it's the question of think about the audience that go to theatres, like older audiences, um, people that aren't maybe aren't as tech savvy as us, sort of potentially. Um, and how are they gonna, and what if they encounter difficulties? What if they haven't charged their phone? What if they don't bring a phone? Do we have to buy phones for 2,000 people? How do we charge them? How do we make sure no one steals them? They like these logistical questions that come into like any kind of immersive experience event. For this, I sort of feel like, um, like a headset makes more sense. Do you agree or disagree? I, dis I disagree. Um, the reason why I disagree is because if how AR headsets are currently work, is that they track the space by having a clear line of sight to the space, and they they kind of use a depth sensor and image to, to generate it. But in a theatre, you're sitting behind people, and there's multiple people, so it might interfere with the track. Um, but I guess if, and then you start to go, well, maybe there's a way to figure out, um, you know, maybe for a limited audience, definitely, I think AR headset would be a good. Would yeah, be this, a good this would be for a limited audience. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, AR glasses, like 3D glasses. Never seen, never used an AR headset. The, okay. The Hololens is pretty cool. That's the only one that I've used, to be honest. Yeah, the Hololens is amazing, and the Hololens just announced Hololens too, uh, which is um, the next iteration of the Hololens. The Magic Leap is also a big AR headset. Essentially, they're a pair of see-through uh, glasses that position on your face with some sort of um, a computer behind and sensors in the frame that track the space, understand it, and then project either directly into your retina or onto the pieces of glass um, objects that then appear to physically exist in the space, but actually they're just being projected onto what you're looking through, if that kind of makes sense. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Glass Enterprise Edition, is that a new thing coming up? Um, HoloLens, oh, that's why the Google Glass Enterprise, AJ, or like HoloLens are doing a kind of um, much more enterprise focused sort of um, leanings for uh, training. So like imagine if I wanted to train someone on how to use equipment but uh, from, a, from a specialist, but I didn't want to fly the specialist out to X location, I could have someone wear an AR headset and train them using it uh, in, in the actual physical space, but not have to have a facilitator there to 
to show them how to do it. Do you know, um, Adam is asking, is the AR safe for your eyes? And I'm assuming he's referring more to the HoloLens. AR safe for your eyes. I'm unaware of the, um, I'm unaware of the literature on that. Um, I'm sure there is some research into it, but we're still early days, so there's been no sure. research into prolonged things. Um, maybe to end, we'll show you one more example of, of like a, of something that I've done um, sure. with an, an, uh, one of my collaborate, collaborators, Andrew Daffy. Um, shout out to Daffy London if you check that out. Uh, he's a really, really cool artist. Is he um, based in London as well? He's based in London, yeah. Nice. Daffy London. Um, if we, so basically a while ago, um, there was this big um, phenomenon on Instagram about an egg. <laughs> Um, oh, this, yeah, you showed me this. I really was um, a fan of this. So there was a big phenomenon about this egg. Um, so what what I decided to, uh, to do with Daffy was basically track um, this 3D model of this egg to a face. <laughs> so if you see my face, like, it's turning, I'm actually controlling the egg. And um, the, the name of this project, aptly. Eggmented Reality. Nice. Um, up here. And that's Daffy London down there. You can follow him on Instagram. We can follow me on Instagram and I am Connor Doyle. <laughs> hey, there we go. Um, but here, so if we look in the scene, there's a lot going on here, but um, um, pretty simply, there's a face tracker um, that you can see here that's um, controlling the rotation of the egg. And if you um, get close enough, right, it changes to your yeah, face. Yeah, and right? like, we did this fade, so on, as I go close, you can sort of see it becomes my face inside the egg. <laughs> so this is just an example of like a cool way to think about Spark AR in like not just, oh, it has to be the face or it has to be something on the face or it has to control. Like this is just an egg in a space <laughs> um, that's being controlled by the rotation of my face. And you see how it's like a different way of thinking about, that's funny, yeah, egg on my face. It's a different way, <laughs> there's so many puns on this. There's, there's different ways of thinking about uh, creating AR experiences that aren't just oh, let's put some glasses on someone, or oh, let's like create this, although those are really cool as well. Um, the same idea over and over again is going to get tiring. Yeah, like think about, oh, so this is playful, right? People try this and immediately like, whoa. It's also very clean and simple. I'm completely lost about this egg thing. Yeah, sorry. So um, just to put it in context, um, <laughs> someone just... uploaded an image of an egg on Instagram, uh, which is a social network, and I think it got the most likes ever. Um, if you just Google... Um, Instagram egg likes or something. I think it got um, this thing. An egg, just a regular egg, is Instagram's most, most liked most post liked ever. Post ever. Thirty-five million people have liked it. And there's more now. Kylie there's Jenner's now. birth announcement. Post. There's like thirty-five million likes of an egg. Of that's, a picture what, of an egg. Ah, that's a TAL for me. I did not know that. Yeah. So we create the create this sort of egg as a sort of. Um, as a fun thing for it. And if we look in the patch editor here, I was going to um, say bring the patch editor up because that, we can see that we, there's a lot kind of going on here, but. What we, the, the main challenge with developing this was um, not having it track directly to the face. So if it just tracks to the face, then if I were to move up and down, it wouldn't stay on the floor. So we had to take the value of, of the floor and lock that into place. And we also wanted to do some smoothing on the head rotation. So as you can see on, in this kind of main perspective view, if I rotate my head left and right, it moves a lot faster than the egg moves. So we wanted to create a kind of latency on it. So it right. sort of moved a bit slower. Feels a little bit more organic. More, more poetically, <laughs> more poetic motion. Poetic egg. So yeah, this is all that this is doing. It's unperking the 3D rotation of the egg and then it's applying some smoothing and dampening here. And then we're doing some other math to control the, the rotation of it. Um, and, and yeah. And then there's a couple of other cool things we can shout out here that, oh, um, if we look, actually under the egg. You see this is kind of like reflection. Uh, that's actually just the egg, Ups another version of the egg upside down. <laughs> that's um, creating this cool reflection to it. And then there's on front of the camera, we've created this little vignette. So you can see that in the main, if we just load this up, in the main thing, there's kind of like a slight vignette that comes in um, here. So yeah, so that's, and we did some lights here. These are dynamic lights that are lighting the egg. Alejo asks, is that on your Instagram page? Uh, no, but it's on Augmented Reality. Uh, you can check that out, Augmented underscore reality. <laughs> did you make that as a page? Uh, we made it as a page. That's funny. I love the rotation. I love this part of it. You see how that's rotating the egg? Yeah. Yeah, there's incredible texture in my dab here. It's, it's a very well-balanced egg. It's, well, we, people wanted to crack the egg. 
We had a lot of requests for let's crack the egg. Oh yeah, that'd be cool actually. Um, you'd have to get an anim you have to get another three D model to represent the crack. Animation. Yeah, we didn't we didn't have time to do the crack. Yeah, that would be <laughs> that would be nice V two though. Yeah, so this is just uh, an example of where we can go with this and um, yeah, in a bit more advanced way. Cool. Yeah, that's a really cool project. Very clean and a very good, I think, illustration of like taking AR and not doing the simple thing you've seen over and over again, which is somebody's face, like having something attached to it. Uh, uh, that is cool, though. Not to say that there aren't cool things. Yeah. Like there are so many examples of really inventive ways of playing with the face and the image, but there are other things as well that can be thought about. This has, I think, potential to really get people's attention in a brand new way. Yeah. To really sink their teeth into. Yeah, and introducing, like, as I said, like, when you're thinking about designing AR experiences, introducing some interactivity in any way, uh, a sense of play, um, and a sense of kind of sp uh, understanding of that we have a kind of palette of space to play with, not just a, a kind of flat plane, then that really will introduce you into understanding immersive sort of storytelling and immersive in augmented reality. Yeah, it's exciting. And this, this, you know, again, this service, Spark AR, completely free. You can get it, you can download it on your computer, you can make stuff, you can put it on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. Um, and it's tools like this that will pave the road for you know, more people getting involved. And, you know, the more people get involved, the more people compete and competition brings about yeah. cool things. And the community is growing and the Facebook Spark AR community page is a really active community and it's, uh, there's, you know, people encounter questions, they're really quick to answer, there's some incredible uh, creators in the space that are really kind of pushing the boundaries of, of what we see on our phones. So I think this is a really exciting step into the augmented reality world and, and one sort of tool in a set of tools uh, to explore storytelling in this space. Yeah, I'm very excited to see what the next five years brings us because it was less than five years ago that this stuff all sort of started coming really to the forefront of yeah. like, modern technology. Exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. <laughs> well, thanks, Connor, for coming yeah, on to today's stream. Really you. appreciate it. I had it. a lot of fun. Thanks, everyone. This, for was, an awesome, in. this was an awesome introduction. Um, so today is Friday. Tune in next week. Nick Wong will be joining us on Tuesday for part two of our CTF. Uh, and then Friday, we'll take a look at the jQuery JavaScript library, which some folks in here might be familiar with. The next sort of extension are sort of web development threads. So people are kindly saying um, thanks for the awesome stream. As thanks, Dave everyone. Kuttenberg, M4 and Ju. Um, so yeah, have a great weekend. Um, and join us next week, Tuesday, 3.30 PM for our CTF, and then Friday with me at 1 PM for jQuery. This was Spark Air. Thanks again, Connor, for this awesome stream. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.